Hey everybody, this is Hercules Pedics, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Hercules Pedics Academy of Comic Book Studies. Today we're going to be looking at all new Underground Comics number three, published in 1973 by Last Gasp. This was part of a series uh, they had in the early 70s. It was almost like a showcase title and uh, probably the most famous um, comic to come out of this series was uh, Two-Fisted Zombies by the Veitch Brothers. But um, this is the only one that was a flip comic. On uh, one side, we have The Mountain by David Silverberg. And the other side, we have High School Funnies by Larry Hubble. Neither of whom I've ever heard of or seen before. But they're pretty good. Definitely doing some weird, interesting stuff. And uh, this uh, mountain one is uh, kind of interesting the way it starts off. with. Uh, <laughs> he doesn't really even have a full cover. He just wants to get into the story too sweet. So <laughs> the story starts on the cover here. And it's basically we see this sculptor named John who's fed up with the big city. And so his girlfriend says, why don't we split and go to my brother's commune for a while? And he's like, OK, I'll try it. He's not much of a guy, a commune guy, kind of a city guy. But he figures uh, the city's pissing him off. So we'll go check it out. The rest of this cover is kind of interesting. It. Uh, Looks way more abstract than the insides do. I did want to point out this really interesting ad for Last Gasp's uh, Skull Horror Comics. Pretty cool uh, little collage of various skulls. And this is for Legion of Charlies, the, the classic underground comic. I also wanted to mention, guys, uh, this week, I know it sounds bizarre, but I'm, I'm, I came down with a case of vertigo, which is, it's pretty bad. I can barely walk straight and it's hard to think. So this is probably not going to be the best episode, but I haven't made a video in a while and uh, it's driving me crazy. I've, I've just been stuck at home, but I figured I've done episodes drunk before. So I feel like I'm really, really drunk right now. That's how vertigo makes you feel. My head's spinning, but I'm going to try to uh, do my best to describe this comic. <clears throat> so uh, John and his girlfriend Lydia make it out to the commune. Her brother Bruce is there. He's kind of a funny, sardonic, hippie guy. And he shows him the most prominent feature at this commune, the mountain. And this is kind of annoying throughout the comic. The mountain seems to change size. And I don't think it's supposed to. I think David Silverberg, the artist, even though he's pretty damn good at drawing lots of stuff, he uh, just didn't quite know how to draw the scale of this. Because this just looks like a big mound here. <laughs> like the size of, I don't know, 25 feet high or something. But it's it's supposed to be a mountain. It's an actual mountain. So uh, John is instantly taken with the mountain. He's kind of mesmerized by it. There's these little openings in it and you can look in and there's like rooms inside. It's kind of hollowed out, but you can't really get it get to them because the openings are pretty small. I see so many different uh, artistic influences in Silverberg in this comic, like definitely some Fulbert Sturgeon, uh, Frank Stack. I even see every now and then I see little Justin Green things, not in the faces at all, but like just the way someone's posed or something. So uh, John has this idea. He's like, yeah, this mountain could be this like, almost like a temple where we could all meditate. This could be a great thing. And uh, he's kind of fascinated by the mountain. He can't stop thinking about it. Even when he goes back to the city, he's thinking about it when he's having sex, while he's stuck in traffic. All of his uh, sculpt, uh, his statues start looking like the mountain. And so finally he, he knows he can't fight anymore. So him and Lydia move back to the commune. Surpri surprisingly, he uh, finds himself uh, taken to communal life. He's, he's cottons to it. He's digging it, but he's still obsessed with that mountain. <laughs> and finally one night he consummates his obsession and gets a hammer and chisel and goes out to the mountain and starts working on it. So basically he's 
he opens it up to everyone. He's like, ah, we can all work on this. It'll, we won't plan it. It'll just be this organic piece of art. And also it'll become our, you know, our temple. And anyone's invited to just contribute. So it sounds kind of cool. Everyone's like, yeah, that sounds fun. And so that night, everyone's tripping at the commune. And John says, guys, let's check out the moonlight. I've never, I'm sorry, let's check out the mountain. I've never seen it in the moonlight. And he goes out and he has this vision. He's struck with a vision. And he sees the mountain as this beautifully carved temple with all these religious symbols all over it. And then check out this. This must have taken him weeks <laughs> or a, a few days if he was on <laughs> speed. But man, look at the detail. This is crazy uh, psychedelic noodling. Pretty fun to look at. It's just, you could look at this for a long time. Look at that crazy, whatever, filaments or filigree. It's nutty. He's got some really basic chops, even though this is obviously like, you know, I don't think he did many comics. I, I don't think, uh, he, I definitely think he would have matured as an artist if he continued, He, you know, he needs some work. But I mean, look at the the way he draws the folds on this. He's definitely got some rudimentary skills down, Pat, you know. He's definitely got some chops. And that's some groovy shit. And he sees it, the potential of the, it being this beautiful temple for all the long hairs. So, uh, one day he's chatting with Bruce. And he's basically, uh, Bruce is kind of like the more cynical guy. And John is almost like, uh, you know, the Messiah about this mountain, just like, how important it could be to everyone to finish this project. So he, uh, Bruce informs him, he says, you know, you got all these plans, but you don't even own this mountain. I mean, it belongs to the rancher. We're squatting on his land. He owns all this land and he owns the mountain too. So John says, we're gonna pay him a visit. And the rancher's a really nice guy. You could say he's a jolly rancher. He's very friendly. And uh, he agrees to sell it to him for 5,000 bucks. So they realize that the only way they're gonna make that money is by selling weed. So they kind of get into the pot business just so they can buy this mountain. And uh, they succeed and the mountain's now theirs. See, now we can see the true scale of the mountain. I mean, obviously this is not that same mountain in the first page, though it's supposed to be, but that's just some, uh, you know, David Silverberg wasn't that great at the at this point. Didn't have all of his chops. But more and more people come to work on the mountain. They hear about this like cool communal art project and everyone wants to do it. This new guy enters the commune named uh, Dan, I believe. He's a wandering bard who told long tales for his bread and board. Kind of like a traveling minstrel. And he becomes very close to John, kind of becomes his main administrator. But more and more people come in and it's getting hard to, you know, they gotta feed them all. So John finds himself more and more in an administrative position, less of an artist and more of just taking care of business, um, figuring out how to sell the drugs, how to distribute the money. Cause everyone looks up to him as basically the leader. And Bruce is becoming more and more disenchanted with the whole business. And Dan suggests that they basically uh, take advantage of, of religion, like hucksters have done th through millennia. He's like, you know, maybe we can uh, put a little shock and awe, religious awe on these people. And they might be all, open up their wallets to us, which, you know, religion's good at that. And John actually goes along with it. Cause I mean, John is still pretty, he's a good guy. Other people are suggesting they uh, charge money at the, at the gate. And he's like, I don't want to turn this into Disneyland. So it really does have lofty uh, spiritual goals.
goals. But he does say, yeah, what's a little harm of a little uh, showmanship? So Dan writes him this uh, very cool speech and he kind of dresses up in this uh, cool hippie garb, almost like a, like a guru. And they're in the caves because now they have uh, succeeded. They've hollowed out the mountain pretty well and put all these beautiful decorations in there. So it has become their temple of meditation. The narrator says, uh, never had a mere mortal looked more divine than John that night. And he gave this incredible speech, which transfixed everyone. So basically there's a change. People start like almost worshiping John, uh, offering him all this like cool stuff. Girls are offering to sleep with him. People are asking him to like judge their art uh, disputes as if he's their like father figure. And so more and more, he's, he's kind of overburdened with this whole, you know, he didn't ask to be a messiah. So he's kind of like checking out, just kind of hiding out. He's tired of dealing with everyone's shit. But uh, they revere him even more because he's, you know, they don't see him that often. So, of course, more and more people come. The rancher comes to visit and says, hey, man. You know, all these guys, they're, it was fine when they were at the commune, but they're flooding into the town. And, you know, all these townies don't like these hippies, so it's causing causing a ruckus. Just be, basically, he's telling them to be careful and figure something out. So the building inspector, a building inspector comes. And they kind of, uh, hippies kind of run them off. But then he comes back with more inspectors and a sheriff, so it's more serious. And they're telling him about all these building code violations they have. And uh, they give him like a few weeks to uh, make the changes. It's not nearly enough time. So they basically say, we're just not going to let him in next time. So when the guy comes back, he says, we're going to evict you, from the, evict you from this land. And that night, they take a vote. And should we just leave or should we resist? And everyone says, we're going to resist. Man, he puts the work in, man. Look at the shading in this panel. That's a lot of lines. I mean, almost every panel. Tons of lines. So the cops show up, it becomes this big showdown. Um, I should have mentioned before the cops show up, like Bruce has uh, really just had enough. Bruce is just like, man, dude, this whole mountain thing's pretty cool, but you've, you've ruined this place. I mean, this place is now like a shit show. Too many people here. Now the cops are coming. It's gonna be a riot. And that is indeed what happens. Because uh, Dan, the troubadour, sees a he sees a truck labeled dynamite. They're like, he's gonna blow up the mountain. So he gets a rock, and everyone starts throwing rocks at this truck and at the cops. So of course the cops do what the cops will do, and they start busting heads and charging the hippies, firing into the air. This page is so cramped together. Like, you probably noticed he doesn't use, the, like, normal panels. I'm pretty sure this guy did not grow up reading comics. Like, he wasn't a huge comic guy. But he was a pretty good artist, and he said, oh, I can do this. Because just do kind of a lack of comic book storytelling devices in this. It's very just like a play where you're just seeing, you know, very kind of static, normal scenes. So they all retreat to the mountain, to the caverns. Uh, 
the police throw in tear gas. And then it's weird. Um, the actual uh, foot soldiers, they're just like, we're not going in there. Fuck that. It's kind of a mutiny. All the soldiers is like, yeah, I don't want to go in there. It's stupid. Fuck this. And they basically this their sergeant or their commanding officer kind of says, okay, maybe you're right. Stand down. Let's just go home. And in the melee, uh, I believe this is Dan. Or is it Bruce? I can't tell. No, I think it's Dan. Dan was really hurt by the cops. The ambulance drivers are like, hey, he probably won't make it. But even though that's, uh, they kind of forget about that pretty quickly. And they have a big celebration because they beat the cops. And then afterwards, John and Lydia get to the top of the mountain. And even though we haven't seen any sign that John has become corrupted, it's, it's this last panel here, which by the way, I love this panel, just the way he's drawn. It seems like he's, starting to get a little megalomania. He says, there's still so much we gotta do, but there's nothing standing in our way. We'll surpass Angkor Wat and Notre Dame and dwarf the temples of the Ganges. What is there to stop us? We'll go on forever. This will be the center of the universe. Oh, Lydia, I'm so happy. <laughs> and that's how it ends. So we're not gonna see all of his horrible excess as a cult leader. But it looks like he's heading down that path already. Man, I gotta look this up because I, I'd be interested to read more of this guy's stuff, David Silverberg. So now the flip, we got a uh, High School Funnies by Larry Hubble. This is very different, very silly, very bizarre. Inside front cover, we got romance comics. Just a, I don't even understand this. And then we start the main comic, High School Funnies. And the t new teacher shows up. His name's Little Ned. And he looks like something from uh, Maury Sendak, you know, where the wild things are. And he just seems like this crazy drunk. <laughs> he's like he snuck in and took over the classroom. Somehow he got past the... Uh, administration some of these panels the cartoony is so nice the style like look at some of these faces they're so well drawn in this weird simple style he even says I've never done teaching before but I've been to a few bars maybe I can fake it and almost all the balloons in here are just like non sequiturs just really bizarre. So he calls up uh, one of the students for show and tell. Missy Moon, her name is. And she giggles and says, I won't show, but I will tell you this. Underneath these clothes, I'm naked. Mumbo Jumbo, Mambo Tango, Spanish Fandango, Elephant Snooze. A public for jive, a public alive, <laughs> a public hidden, a public forbidden. I don't know if those are lyrics from a song, but that's really weird. And she says, what we need is a new dance step. So everyone starts doing this, these weird dance steps. And then like, look at this guy, <laughs> totally different like uh, species of cartoon character. And they start having a water pistol fight, which turns into a full on like buckets of water. And little Ned, the teacher gets wet. And he says, I smell like a wet dog now. So now we see in the basement with Lord Lucy. And we follow the camera as it goes down into this basement. Back behind the stairs is this room. It's, everything's filthy. And we see Lucy standing on a bed and she says, get the hell out of here. Bye. <laughs> I don't know. 
But that panel, I see like Melinda Gibby, even a little less Clay Wilson. It's weird how many like, he has a very unique style. Um, I definitely see some of that like uh, Moscosco-ness in it. I think he was very influenced by him. But then I see flashes of other artists. So now we see this little heading, Desperate Comics. And little Ned, it looks like he's out in the desert. And this guy, this very furtive looking dude, shows up. And he says, hey, what's with Lucy? She really jumped on me. So I guess he was the point of view of that last page. Yeah, this, I can definitely see like the Moscosco here when they're on this desert landscape. So now we're back in high school. All the kids, it's nap time. And I guess I've been sleeping. And it's nighttime already. They slept through the whole day. And all of a sudden a baby buggy shows up. It's, it's the rumor, baby. <laughs> Seems like something from David Letterman or something. From the old David Letterman show. And, uh... It hands him a little note with a rumor on it. So he says, what's the rumor for today? It says here that the buffalo are returning. You might take into account that around 1890, several groups of people did some heavy praying, the ghost dance. I wonder if there's a time limit on prayers. So apparently all those prayers the Native Americans did, uh, it, took, it took a while. It took about 70 years. And then uh, Missy Moon sits on a pin. And this other wiseacre says... Simply turn the other cheek, my dear. She whomps him on the head with her pocketbook. And so he says, take out your books. And he asks this guy to read. And we see uh, Missy Moon behind him, just totally in love with hearts around her eyes. Look at that face. They're so good when they're good. And he totally starts macking on him. Starts pulling down his pants even. And he's like, cut it out. Everyone's staring at us. She's like, oh, Herb, you're such a butt. And she storms off. Then we see this little Yeti kid. I don't know what his story is. A lot of these things that make no sense. And uh, her Herb says, what the fuck are you looking at? And he throws a book at his head. And uh, he throws the book back and hits this girl. Kind of turns into a little book fight. And then Missy Moon goes over to Earl, the weird, weirdly drawn guy. And she says, do you think I'm pretty, Earl? So the little Yeti guy's trying to explain what happened. When little Ned comes back from the bathroom. It's like, what's going on here? And so he's explaining. And Ned just punches him. Right in the face, and he disappears. Does he keep mentioning the coconut radio? <laughs> I don't understand. There's also an interesting thing I want to point out. I just noticed this at the second reading. So, you know, like I said, he punches the little Yeti kid. He disappears. On the very first page of this comic, when little Ned introduces himself... One of the first things he says is, things aren't always as they seem. For instance, that guy I just hit was no student, but a dollop. And don't worry, he'll reassemble in, into some form or the other. So it's like, just so trippy. Like, he was referring to this thing in the future. And I don't think it's a pagination thing. I don't think they got the pages out of order. Because uh, this continues the fight while he was in the bathroom.
I just, everyone just, it's, it's almost like a bad acid trip. There's these weird sounds. People are like, what was that? I feel creepy all of a sudden. Just people feel off. And then he says, oh, I think we're going to have a surprise visitor any second. And all of a sudden, it's uh, the blackboard starts moving. And this guy pops out. And he says, hi, I'm deaf. This kid says, hey, you stink. So everyone starts singing, death, death, go away, come again another day. And death says, okay. But remember, whatever you're doing, I'm behind you all the way. Bye for now. And uh, everyone's all like weirded out. And Missy Moon says, I'll be glad to get out of this crummy cartoon alive. Look at that face. That is so good. So daylight has come. They made it through the night. And they're like, let's go eat breakfast. And they all march off to find some place to eat breakfast. And, uh, I don't know what the hell happened for the past 16 pages or so. Ooh, but man, I just like how weird this is. It's fun to read this kind of sh stupid, crazy shit. That's why I love the undergrounds, like I always talk about. They just put it all out there, baby. So there you have it. I hope you enjoyed looking at all new underground comics number three. Uh, it was very interesting for me to go through it, cause, uh, especially because I'm suffering vertigo. <laughs> and my head is totally spinning now. I, it's hard to talk. So I guess I should wrap it up. I hope you enjoyed it, like I said. And also, I hope to see you next time here at the Hercules Penix Academy of Comic Book Studies.